Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jamie Bade, a member of um, the evaluation team with Family Planning Elevated. You know what, I just realized I want to record this. So let me... I think we are recording. Oh, recording. Okay, yeah, perfect. Ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, so I want to welcome you all to our contraceptive education series. For those of you who are new to Family Planning Elevated, we are a statewide contraceptive initiative housed at the University of Utah, and our goal is to make contraceptives accessible to all Utahns. And for more information, you can head over to our brand new website, myfpe.org. Um, today, we, get, we have the great fortune of hearing from Jessica lewis Caperol, and she is presenting Barrier Methods, an update on patient-controlled options. And I am personally really excited for this session because these are the contraceptive methods that I know the least about, um, particularly some of the brands that have come on the market in recent years. So if that's true for anyone else, rest assured we're all in the right pl place. Jessica is ready to share her wealth of knowledge with us. And speaking of knowledge, we here at Family Planning Elevated are complete data nerds. Um, there's no denying it. So in order to measure what you learn today, we're asking that everyone take a really quick five question survey before we begin. If you received the link that we sent by email and you've taken it already, thank you. And if you haven't taken it yet, don't worry, we're going to let you do it right now. So you'll see the link on your screen to type into your browser. And I've also pasted that link in the chat box. Or if you have a smartphone handy, you can open up your camera app and hover it over the QR code and it will open the survey that way. So we're gonna give everyone three or four minutes to allow you to answer those five questions. And don't worry or overthink these. It's fine to guess if you're not sure. The idea is that um, you will be able to answer these and get your shot at redemption when you retake the survey after the webinar. And if you have any trouble accessing the survey, please um, let us know in the chat box. Okay, hopefully everyone was able to complete that. Now, uh, a few quick notes before I hand the stage to Jessica. Everyone is muted, but we do encourage your participation. Please um, freely use the chat function and we'll be able to see those um, comments as they come up, as well as the reactions buttons and then the annotations um, you can actually 
click on the annotate button at the top of your toolbar. If you're feeling creative, um, feel free to try them out and you can do stamps or indicate questions. We have someone leaving some lovely stars on our slide right now. And next up, uh, for if you have demo units of barrier methods, um, please go ahead and grab those. You may have those available for patient education or some of our contraceptive access program clinics uh, have Kaya test fitters and FemCap demo units on hand. So those will be helpful to follow along with as Jessica covers each one. If you have those accessible, please grab them. At the end of today's session, I will review instructions on how to claim the CME credit. And then we'll also set aside five minutes at the end for you to complete your post webinar survey. Without further ado, let's welcome Jessica Lewis Caperell. Jessica is a doctoral prepared board certified family nurse practitioner specializing in family planning here at the University of Utah. Jessica began her career as a labor and delivery nurse in Oregon, eventually making her way to Utah to practice nursing at the Salt Lake City VA Women's Veterans Clinic and Planned Parenthood. She now serves as clinical training specialist for the Family Planning Elevated Program, providing training on contraception to primary care providers throughout the state. Jessica, we're so glad to have you here today. Take it away. All right, thank you, Jamie. And hello, everyone. We're so happy that you're here today for our, um, our first series of education on different contraceptive methods. So today I will be covering um, an update on barrier methods or patient controlled methods. So again, we try to be inclusive of gender identity. And so most of the time I will be referring to patients as women, but just know um, there may be some other um, you know, groups that we want to make sure that these methods are inclusive for as well. And so again, I have of course lots of visual aids I'll be sharing with you today, but we're, barriers are on all of our minds right now. So of course we've got our barrier masks. We've got lots of colors, fabrics, We've got our goggles, we've got all kinds of stuff. So, but now we're gonna focus on some barriers to prevent pregnancy and also prevent infections. All right, so just one disclosure to go over, I am a certified uh, trainer for the next one on implant from Merck. I will not be covering um, that. I just want you to know that that is something that um, I do need to disclose. So. Our objectives for today are, we're going to be covering just, again, this is going to be a bird's eye view and just some important points to remember on the most current barrier methods. So that's including um, cervical cap, um, the diaphragm, condoms, both male and female, and um, both spermicide and sponge as well. So I'll go over the correct way to use them, um, kind of go over some counseling points, and then how to support making those available into your uh, clinic as well for patients. All right, so we'll start with diaphragm. So there's two models that are currently out on the market. So there's the Kaya, which I love because it is purple, and I'll show you a picture of that and a model in just a moment. And then there's also the Milex Omniflex um, that is um, uh, manufactured by the Cooper Surgical, um, which is the current. There's been some different um, manufacturers through time, but this, this is the most current and only way to get the multiple size diaphragm. And so that model does require fitting and it currently comes in eight different sizes. And I'll go over a little more of how women are fit for that um, model as well. Now effectiveness, again, through all of these barrier methods, I'm going to try to present the most um, evidence-based effectiveness. You may see a variation in some of these percentages, but just know with proper use and with correct use, a lot of these methods can be very effective for preventing pregnancy, um, but they do, of course, require some education on part of the patient and some practice, you know, just to build those skills. So just know that that is part of that as well. And then um, also just know with the diaphragm, spermicide is highly, highly recommended to increase, of course, the effectiveness with the diaphragm. And I'll go over um, spermicide in detail 
when it's used alone, but just know that when I'm talking about um, our teaching with diaphragm and with cervical cap, we want to encourage uh, spermicide use, and I'll go over that. And also, you know, it's okay to use a vaginal lubricant to help with comfort with intercourse, but because the diaphragm and the um, femcap, cervical cap are silicone uh, material, we want to make sure to educate our patients not to use a silicone-based vaginal lubricant. Um, but it's okay to use that spermicide, and the spermicide is safe and will not decrease effectiveness. It will only boost effectiveness, okay? All right. The other important counseling point on diaphragm is just to remember that um, it does not provide uh, protection for sexually transmitted infections. So we would just want to say, all right, you know, you want to maybe add either using the male or female condom along with that method. And all of these methods, it's okay to combine. There's no reason why you have to choose just one method or the other. So just know that that's something just to kind of think in the back of your mind as well. Now, diaphragm does require prescription from you to your patients, and there are ways for you to stock those methods in your clinic um, on the shelf, just like any other medical um, product or prescription product. However, um, you can also write a prescription and then patients should be able to get that from a pharmacy. Some pharmacies stock them more readily, some don't. Don't So just kind of maybe explore your options um, so that you know if and when that comes up how to help your patients get the method that they would like. The other thing that's really important, and I'll, I'll be showing you a model here too, but um, there are, in the demo units, there's often a hole, <laughs> um, and that is to allow for cleaning and disinfection for um, fitting models that, that are used in your clinic. So you really want to stress to your patients to inspect the diaphragm before every use and just make sure there's no hole, tear, or any other, um, you know, because um, that, that would help, um, of course, decrease, effect, decrease the effectiveness and put her at risk as well. Now, we'll kind of go over fitting as well. The Kaya is, a, is only in one size, and that is with all their um, innovation was designed to kind of fit the most um, of those middle sizes of the more fitted diaphragm. Now, with the more fitted sizes as well, it's really important to, to talk with your patients and let them know, okay, if, if there's any changes in our bodies, which are very common as women go through their um, reproductive life, um, that there can be a loss or gain of 10 pounds or more, they may be in a different size, um, or if they've had a pregnancy. So maybe they were fit with a one size before pregnancy, and now they're gonna be in a different size after pregnancy. So just know that that's really important as well. Now, there are a few co contraindications to remember for a diaphragm. We don't recommend using the diaphragm when they're in that very early postpartum period. A couple reasons for that is one, there could be some risk of infection, um, and two, because remember there's those changes in the cervix after having a delivery, she may be in an, a different size, and so it may the diaphragm she had before pregnancy may not be the same um, or fit the same after. Also, if your patient has a known or diagnosed pelvic organ prolapse, so remember that's if that cervix is maybe coming. Um, lower in the in the vaginal vault, you know, there's going to be maybe a harder time getting a good fit or seal. And then also, if she's um, maybe sees you often for chronic vaginal infections, and that could be yeast, uh, bacterial vaginosis, just know she may be okay with this method, but she could be at risk for having, um, you know, either worsening or continued chronic infections. All right, so let's take a look at our first uh, model. And so this is the, the Kaya. You can kind of all see this here. Um, this is what the actual box looks like if you are able to get this on your shelf. The cool thing about this is on the back, there's a nice little instruction and diagram. So if you have it in your clinic, you can pull this out. You can say, okay, here's the important things. This is how you load. Um, this front side, which I'm going to go over right now. So 
just to kind of look at the shape here. So this little, um, they call it the removal dome. So this is going to be at the front of her pelvis underneath. And so this, it fits right nicely in the finger and that helps with removal. So it's not so much with insertion, but with removal. Now for insertion, you can look on the sides and you can see there's these little bumps. And so again, think spermicide is very slippery. So this can help with grip as far as like helping her place it um, successfully. And so you can see, you just kind of put um, thumb and um, forefinger there and then just kind of squeeze like that. And then you can see these two like little um, areas to put the spermicide in as well. So that's how that's placed. Now remember, this is gonna be, if this is the cervix, it's covering the cervix, okay? So, and this is towards the outside of the, of the body. Okay, so the cool thing, these last up to two years. Um, and again, we kind of talked about those sizes. So it was designed to fit that 65 to 80 millimeter size range. Um, and it can be left in place up to 24 hours. And this can include during that 24 hours, multiple acts of intercourse. Now with each um, additional um, encounter of intercourse, she'll want to place more spermicide into the vagina, but leave the diaphragm in place. And then the most important thing to educate her is to leave that diaphragm in place for six hours after the last encounter. And so that holds the spermicide up against the cervix. That helps to make sure that all the sperm are have passed on to the beyond um, before you remove that uh, diaphragm. All right, so I'll go over also the, um, the more fitted, more traditional um, model. I've got, again, a couple. So you can kind of see they come in like different sizes. So in this picture in the slide here, you can kind of see the fitting kit that you can purchase for your clinic. And that kind of helps to have on hand when you, if you have a patient that is interested in the diaphragm. Now, there are lots of great resources online if you're, but there's not, it just really comes to kind of practice with trying to help patients get this fit. And I'm gonna go over this really quick. So first thing, you know, you'll make sure she has an empty bladder. Um, when she comes to see you, you will do a pelvic exam first, just to kind of make sure you can feel the cervix, just kind of maybe gauge the size of the vaginal vault. And then um, oftentimes I'll place on the tray, like maybe the two sizes that I'm thinking she will be. And again, that's just based on looking at them and your initial exam. Then um, what I do, and again, you'll, when you're placing it for her to help the fitting process is you'll you'll bend this like this in half like a little taco shell and then this of course is then inserted and then this will be covering the cervix like that okay so then what I once I figure out the correct size I remove it and then I place the correct size on a drape and then I leave the room and I let her place it herself. And then I come back in and do a repeat pelvic exam just to make sure it was placed correctly. And then just go over the final education on that. Um, but if you have more questions, I'm happy to answer those. I know that's kind of a brief um, explanation, but the most important thing is teaching her about where does the sperm side go? So it kind of goes right in the bowl here. So again, it's gonna be up against the cervix there. All right, so now we're going to kind of jump to the fem cap, which again, I also love because of the colors. They are very beautiful. Now, again, this is a product you can also have stocked in your clinic and it comes in three different sizes. So again, this is what the little boxes look like that you might be seeing in your clinic. Um, it has the size, you know, clearly marked on the on the side so you don't have to open it, you know that it's there. Now, you can get these cool little fitter um, test kit and samples as well. So again, what I have here is the sapphire. So again, just kind of looking at the millimeters, the pearl is the 22 millimeter, then um, the sapphire is 26, and then the emerald is 30. So this is kind of what 
the life size looks like. And you can kind of see there's like this little strap. And so this helps with placing and, and removing, but it's really helpful for removing. All right, now there's some really important differences between the cervical cap and the diaphragm. Um, of course, again, this is 100% silicone, so similar to the diaphragm. So for women who are worried about latex sensitivity, this is not latex in any way. Um, the sizing, so again, it's kind of more, not so much by you fitting um, her, but look, thinking, okay, by her history. Has she had a zero pregnancies? Um, she'd probably be the pearl size if she's had, if she's had a pregnancy, but not a vaginal delivery. Um, Sapphire is probably going to be the best size for her. And if she has had a prior vaginal birth, the emerald is probably going to be the best size. So that kind of makes it a little easier. Um, just remember, everybody's individual. So that's not like a hard, fast rule. It's just what um, is most common. Now, the femcap can be left in place a little longer, up to 48 hours. But again, back to that number six, leave in place, do not dislodge, do not move um, for six hours after the last encounter. And again, if there's multiple encounters, she will just want to make sure to place another dose of the spermicide. Um, speaking of spermicide, um, where the spermicide goes with this method is different than with the diaphragm. So if you look back to the little strap, it's like a little bowl. So it's gonna be going here on the dome, not on the part where the cervix will kind of suction up again. So, and the reason is these little flanges will kind of play, will make like a little barrier and suction against the vaginal wall. So that's why, and it'll kind of catch the ejaculate here at the dome. So that's the way that that's been des, um, designed. The older models, again, I think were a lot harder for women to get like up on the cervix. And I, so, so I think this is definitely an improved design. Now, um, you can see this is not going to be kind of, um, having any pressure at all up against the urethra. So some women with the with the diaphragm may experience some urinary tract infection. So just know this doesn't do the same. Um, so maybe if she's having issues with the diaphragm, this might be an alternative to switch to. Okay, so we're gonna go over spermicide. So um, this VCF brand is probably the most common that you'll see in the stores and, and also something that you can stock in your clinic as well. The active ingredient is the Noxone 9. And so, again, the most common right now are the, the vaginal gel and the film. And I'll go over those in just detail a little more. So the cool thing about the, the vaginal gel, and so this is the life-size box, kind of what you'd see. And again, this is stocked in the same aisle of the store with like, for example, condoms or other items. So you might have to just show patients like what to be looking for. Um, but this box comes with 10 applicators. So similar to, so kind of discreet. Um, this is what one of the applicators look like. So very, like you would think this could be a tampon. Looks very similar. So very discreet. Um, also, I'll just kind of show it comes with um, a little plunger that you would just kind of screw in. And then of course the cap gets screwed, screwed off as well. Now, the cool thing, this is effective right away, so there's no um, need to wait. And again, this is what we were talking about, um, having used in addition, of course, to the diaphragm and to, um, femcap, but this can be used all by itself as well, um, or with condoms. So again, add that on as well. Um, the film is, again, a clear little, um, kind of like any other, um, you might see like those mouth strips. So this is like a similar kind of consistency. Placing that method is just a little bit trickier. It needs to be placed at least 15 minutes before um, intercourse. It does last longer, you know, just because of the um, chemical makeup and it can last up to three hours. So just, it has to be placed before and can last up to three hours. The film, I would not recommend if we're using it in addition to the diaphragm or femcap. But if we're using it alone, it can be used um, just fine. There's no um, 
toxicity. So again, if there's any um, oral intercourse or anything else going on, there won't be any um, trouble with the male partner. So just know that as well. Now, we've all maybe kind of heard a little bit about some of the risks of spermicide. Um, first of all, it does need to be reapplied. It can cause some breakdown of the skin. So think, if, if you have a patient who may be at higher risk of um, sexually transmitted infections, especially um, HIV, just think maybe we want to use this plus condoms for sure, and maybe make sure to stress that as well. Um, there is known, some women definitely can experience some vaginal um, irritation, and also the male partner um, can have some penile itching and burning as well. Okay, so now we'll just kind of go over probably the method, just quick review of the one we're probably the most um, familiar with. And so of course, male condom, and then again, this is of course a very condom, a, a very um, common package you might see in your clinic or or in the um, where patients can access. Just when you're talking with patients about condoms, just give them you know just the, review the basics, especially if you know maybe they haven't had a really good um, education at school or wherever they um, receive their. Um, education. Just make sure that it's accurate. Just make sure to um, educate them to check the package, make sure that they're, um, check the expiration date, check for any punctures in the packaging, and then just go over the correct placement, which is over an erect penis, leaving just that little um, area at the tip of the condom for the ejaculate to be contained, and then also go over, okay, how to safely remove the condom, make sure that, um, and again, we want our female patients and male patients to both have this education, but how to uh, remove the condom correctly to um, decrease risk of spillage of the ejaculate because that can lead to um, pregnancy as well. And then just remember, um, just repeat new condom with each um, active intercourse as well. So, all right, now female condoms. Some of you, this might be new. Um, this is actually the second version of the female condom. There was um, the first version. There was some kind of um, some noise issues and some other things. So they've kind of redesigned this a little bit. So I think this has um, been very popular um, when once patients know that there's been some updates. So again, this is not a latex product. So for people who may have um, latex allergy, this should not be causing an issue with them. It can be inserted up to eight hours prior to sexual intercourse. So that might be something if, if women just want to have on, on hand. Um, it does protect against sexually transmitted infections. So um, again, here is the, the real package. I kind of just showed there's a little tear here um, indicator to make sure that the condom itself doesn't get torn. Um, oh, whoops, let me go back. Just one second here. Let me just show you what one actually looks like. So this is the size. So inside, what kind of holds it in place is, I'll take it out. <laughs> it looks kind of like the Nuva ring and it's soft and flexible, just kind of like that same size. And so again, this is at the, at the end that's gonna be going in, um, inside. And so again, for insertion, you know, again, this will be lubricated, so it'll be really slippery. I kind of washed this one off just to kind of help with um, the demonstration, but just no kind of pinching it and to help with insertion and tucking into the vaginal vault. And then this larger ring, of course, stays on the outside of the body. Okay. But they're a great option. All right, so now we just kind of go over the sponge, which again, this is the, the life size box. And again, this is also something you can stock in your clinics. This is available over the counter. Um, it has the same active ingredients, the Noxyl 9, just like the spermicide. Um, it is effective right away. So patients can place this and then there's no waiting period for it to be activated. And again, this kind of goes back to that number six. So leaving the place for six hours after the last active intercourse. Um, and that just helps, of course, that spermicide um, 
have maximum effectiveness before it's removed. Now, again, on the packaging, it does talk about um, a 30 hour maximum. So that, again, that's including that 24 hours of intercourse plus the six additional hours. Okay, so again, we want to help by um, family planning elevated. A lot of our um, FPE CAP clinics may be seeing some of these methods. In fact, all of them can be stocked as part of our program. And so you may see those show up on your shelves and have available just in your clinic to dispense to patients who want this method. And actually any um, clinic can also help to um, utilize these. So if you have patients that are becoming interested in them, this is something you can purchase from the companies and have stocked in your clinic. And you don't need a large stock. I don't think that you're going to, I mean, unless you have this being like the method of the year, but just having, you know, maybe one, um, one of each size of the femcap, maybe one or two kaya diaphragms just to have on hand. Um, but just know, I think that's going to first, it's going to help um, if this is truly the method that your patients are wanting to use, that's going to help them leave with a method that they wanted, that's going to help them have higher satisfaction. So just know, I think that, um, you know, we want to support that in any way. All right. Okay, so just to kind of summarize. Um, barrier methods are part of comprehensive family planning. And again, just remember, we can combine any of these with maybe some of the other methods that we're thinking about. So you can always combine condoms, male or female, with IUDs, with implants, um, because we are, of course, seeing more infections, more sexually transmitted infections. So that's going to um, help really have that on the mind of patients. So none of the methods that I covered today have any hormones at all. You know, we do have patients who can't tolerate hormones, maybe for medical reasons or maybe um, due to emotional reasons. Maybe they have, you know, um, severe depression and any uh, um, alteration in, in hormone um, is, is not, doesn't work well for them. So just know, of course, there are other long acting reversal methods like the Paragard IUD, but if that's not one that they're interested in, just don't forget about all these. Um, so just know there's lots of options that are non-hormonal. And maybe you have a patient who doesn't have intercourse very frequently at all. Maybe they have a partner that's um, maybe lives far away and they don't want to have to have a method that they use on a daily basis when they only maybe have intercourse um, infrequently. So this is something that can be used for those patients. Um, all right, and then also just to know these methods do take some education and some practice to become successful with. So um, make sure that they, they are getting that from you. And then also um, they're environmentally friendly. If you think about the diaphragm and the fem cap being um, can last up to two years. So that's um, reusable. And let's see, I think I went over all that. Okay, everybody, is there any questions on any of these methods? And please go ahead and type questions in the chat box as you think of them. And Jessica, we do have um, a couple questions that have come through already. Okay, great. So the first one is, um, she asks, my patients that use menstrual cups often have a hard time removing due to suction on the cervix. Does the user have to break the suction on the diaphragm or cap for removal? So it's possible, again, with the, especially with the uh, fem cap, because that is the mechanism of action is a suction. So the, the nice thing is, Again, the design, it has that little strap that can help maybe loop the finger underneath to help um, break that suction. And then the diaphragm, I haven't seen that as much of a suction as just kind of because it's like tension. Um, and so that's why I think with the, with the new design with the Kaya, that it has that finger kind of just to pull out. So it's kind of more of the muscles of the vagina holding it in place more than suction on the diaphragm. But Definitely section with the uh, fem cap. 
Thank you. Um, another question is for the effectiveness on the diaphragm, is the 92% perfect use, is that with spermicide or without spermicide? With spermicide. Okay. Yeah. Because again, you're combining those two methods. Okay. So there are some women who just cannot tolerate the spermicide due to like irritation and burning. And so I know that there are some ongoing research on trying to find maybe a different type of um, spermicide without the noxinal 9, but we just don't have one that's readily available at this time. But I know that it is um, something that's being looked at for future. Thank you. Another question, what about the cost of these options? So approximate, so again, have to think it, it varies. Um, approximately 80-ish dollars for the FemCap and the Kaya and Diaphragm at a like high cash price. Now, insurance of course may cover because this is a uh, family planning method and also uh, funding through our Family Planning Elevated program covers these methods at 100%. So if, if patients really want this method, let us know if, if we're having any trouble um, getting those for them. But there are ways to, to definitely lower those costs. Wonderful, thank you. Another question, do you see that patients are happier with diaphragm or with cervical cap in general? And follow up to that, if they don't care which one, do you recommend one versus the other? So one question I kind of start with is, you know, um, what, it, what are her thoughts about, you know, pregnancy if this method, if there are some, you know, pregnancy, because it, it could happen. <laughs> and so just kind of going over that as well. Um, and then just kind of see what her technical ability skills are. If she's like a master um, menstrual cup user, this may be a great option. Um, I get it's really just kind of, I think, having her look at these models and touch them. I think that that's going to help her decide too, like what could work better. And also, having them available in your clinic to let her try it out um, will also kind of help. So I don't want to say as far as like my own personal um, preferences, I think what's been hard is just access to having, you know, training and fitting models what, in whatever clinic I was in. And, and it was really hard to get the FemCap um, fitting kits in the different locations I've been. So that's probably where I haven't prescribed it as much as a diaphragm. But I don't know, I, th I think it's more of patient preference and kind of just starting out on like, where are they interested and kind of going from there. Thank you. And I know you already covered this, um, but one question that came up with was, which methods are good options for women in the postpartum period? Yeah, that's a good, good question. So medically, um, there are many couples who have intercourse sooner than that six week uh, postpartum mark and have intercourse without any discomfort. Women, if they are not exclusively breastfeeding, you know, can experience a pregnancy. So just kind of at that maybe end of their prenatal care, just kind of helping them decide. I don't recommend using the, the diaphragm or the cervical cap in that early postpartum period. As we kind of talked about the fitting, first of all, like there, there may be the wrong size now based on what she had before. And then there could be, you know, just this more slightly risk of infection just while she's going through that healing process as well after the delivery. So I would steer her more towards the female or the male condom if we're really needing a barrier method in that really early postpartum period. Okay, and if you have individuals who are interested in learning um, how to fit diaphragms, how and where would they obtain that type of training? Yeah, so, the, the manufacturer, let's see, 
of the FemCap has this nice giant packet they can get out to you <laughs> with like videos and diagrams and everything. But I'm also very willing to, you know, be a resource for any clinician who wants to um, get some extra training on fitting and and even just being there with you in your clinic um, if you're one of our FP CAP clinics. Um, yeah, there's lots of resources out there and I'm happy to, to help guide in any way. Great, I'm loving all these questions. Um, another question is, you talked about uh, that some methods don't protect against STIs. Is it, so is it possible to use both a diaphragm and an internal condom at the same time? Of course. Okay. So we have a comment, not a question. Um, I love that these methods provide more non-hormonal user-controlled options. Given the history of reproductive coercion and family planning, many patients, especially women of color, may have concerns about provider-dependent methods. Having more options that meet their need for personal control over the method is a benefit. And is that um, something you've seen, Jessica? Do patients talk about the being able to control their methods? Yeah, and again, I think it's, we're in a different time right now, again, with the pandemic and all of, um, just kind of our world is turned upside down right now. And so I think when we are, when we are seeing our patients, I think just really having an open-ended conversation with them to, to see, you know, what is their reproductive life plan? You know, what, um, what about safety? Is there any um, interpersonal violence in the relationship going on? Is she a sex worker? Is there anything else that maybe we don't know that could help us um, help her choose a method that's going to be um, empowering, the one that she feels good about, which I think is, at the end of the day is the most important thing is that we're listening to our patients. And it may not be the method we would that we recommend to them like maybe there's maybe a more effective option or whatnot but these methods can be used successfully effectively and especially with the right education and training which is the most critical piece is making sure our patients have all the information um, is the most important thing so it's it's listening to them and hearing them and then providing the method that they want. Thank you. And we had another um, great comment come through that said, not a question, but I would love to put together a basket with all of these methods so they can be held, touched, yeah. and considered more closely. Yes. And that I highly recommend. <laughs> because I, I'm, I'm, as you can see, I like to have examples. I like to have things that um, patients can see because I think then the, the mystery is less the fear or uncertainty. I mean, think about maybe the first time you try to explain to maybe a young patient, you know, how to place a tampon or maybe with a daughter or, I mean, there's just a lot of like anxiety, you know, with the first time of any object in the vagina. So just think we want to make sure our patients feel comfortable and um, confident. Plus, then they can see those great colors on the fem cap. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Jessica, could you just uh, give a little snippet of how you talk to patients about adding additional spermicide? Yeah. With the diaphragm, does it yes. look like does it need to be up close to the diaphragm or just within the oh. canal? Yeah. So that's why. And again, I'll show the applicator again, so you can kind of see the length. I would make sure that it is placed as far up next to the diaphragm as possible. Um, and again, just remember um, it lasts for one hour <laughs> and one encounter. So if there's, even if it's less than one hour, but it's a new encounter, another dose is needed. And okay. don't, don't remove the diaphragm to place the new from the side. Great. Well, we are to the end of our questions. Any other uh, burning questions that anyone has that they want to submit? Doesn't look like it. 
So let's go ahead and as promised, I will share how to claim your CME. Oh, I don't know why this is not wanting to work. Let's see. But thank you everybody for being here today. We are just very excited that you're here and, and willing to learn more about different methods and just know I am always available for questions. And if I don't know the question right off the bat, I will find it for you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you. Okay, so for those interested in claiming uh, one CME credit for this webinar, Caitlin will email you the code and instructions for claiming your credit once you've completed your post -web webinar survey. If you've set up a CME profile with the U of U before, this should be really simple. Just call the phone number and enter your event code. If you haven't set up a CME profile with the U before, you will be asked to complete a brief form before claiming your credit. The most important thing to understand is that the CME credit must be claimed before midnight tonight. If you forget and try to enter it tomorrow, it will not work. The instruction guide uh, that we'll be sending along should answer most of your questions, but please don't hesitate to email us if you need any assistance on that. And then finally, we ask that you complete our post webinar survey. Just like before, there are three different ways to get there. You can type the URL into your browser click on that same link that you accessed at the beginning in the chat box or hover your smartphone camera over the QR code. The survey will ask if the webinar has taken place yet and answer yes so that you can have the appropriate questions appear for you. It has been such a pleasure hosting all of you today and we hope that you'll join us for new topics in our webinar series. Next month we are having um, Dr. Jen Kaiser teach adolescent friendly contraceptive services and the dates for those webinars are in that box there and um, Caitlin can send you additional information for registration as well.